We attend a meeting a few times a year called the Drift Meeting. That stands for the clear for me we can invade a box. And it can be the most frustrating meetings that you've ever come across. But one day, there was a speaker there from the Research Council. And her name was Zilda Bard Klein. And for the first time in four years, I actually got stimulated and listened. Hildegard's been working at ARC on biological control of declared weeds. She's a humorous lecturer and had me giggling more than once when I should have had a straight face. <laughs> she's qualified and she's actually a Pretoria person. She's one of us, her feet are on the ground. Hildegard, with all your academic achievements, thanks for being here today and thanks for sharing your knowledge. And please tell them about the government child. Who? Oh. I should. Thanks, Joe. Um, this is actually a long story, so I'm not sure I'll be able to manage everything. Um, the biological control of invasive alien plants, um, our, our um, weeds research division at the Plant Protection Research Institute um, has been doing research on this for many years and I thought it's very relevant to you to know how it works. Um, the basic principle about it is that where plants grow in their natural environment they have natural enemies and they don't become problematic but once you take the plant out of that environment without its natural enemies it often becomes um, invasive such as um, uh, chain fruit chola, a, a cactus, uh, it's the one that I do research on this is in South Africa and you can see a few isolated plants in its natural habitat in Mexico but surrounded with other plants. So one plant species do doesn't dominate the others but without its natural enemies in South Africa it does dominate the whole area and nothing else um, eventually grows there. Um, you can control invasive alien plants in several ways. Uh, you can pull them out or, or fell them but mechanical control has drawbacks such that as um, many plants regrow after you've cut them down and actually become worse than they were before. Instead of one stem, they are now a thicket. Um, there are already many seeds of those plants in the soil and these now get more sunlight and, and will more readily germinate. Um, you can cause a lot of soil erosion if you pull out the trees roots and all. Uh, and this is especially um, very worrying on slopes where um, erosion will occur and it's very expensive. You can use herbicides and often a combination of mechanical control and herbicides but you can't uh, use herbicides near water, they'll contaminate the water, they can damage non-target plants if you don't apply them in the right way and also they are expensive too. So um, biological control is um, an alternative um, or a uh, not, not a substitute always but a, um, it often complements other control methods. It's the use of host specific natural enemies to bring about the long term or sustainable control of the target plant. Host specific means that they will not damage any other plant species. They can certainly not complete their life cycle on other un unwanted or non-target plant species and that is what most of our research goes into to make sure that they are host specific um, and um, natural enemies come from the country of origin of the weed and uh, the ideal is to get sustainable control in other words they will not eradicate the target weed, they will always leave a few individuals of the weed behind and that ensures that there are food plants for the natural enemies to um, sustain their numbers. In other words, they never eradicate the target plant, they only keep it under um, uh, control. Um, the aim of biocontrol is therefore not eradication but to uh, bring the, the um, target weed 
to a level where the plant is no longer problematic. Um, and that is for every individual land user to determine. If we have reached that point, then we say we have a biocontrol success. Uh, the benefits of biocontrol, first, because we only release host specific natural enemies, that there will be no non-target effect, such as um, herbicides um, affecting the wrong plant species. Um, not all the plants die at the same rate. Some plants will die, others will just uh, be weakened. And so there will not be a sudden depletion of a whole vegetation in an area and leaving a dust bowl condition such as some people always fear that will happen. Never happens like that. The yeah, um, biocontrol agents are mostly active. They can fly and they can search out the target weeds. It's not necessary for us to, be, um, to even know where each individual target plant is growing. The insects can find them for us. They can get there on their own. Uh, some species, such as cochineal, have to be hand dispersed to a certain extent, but the, uh, they normally are wind dispersed and they can crawl for short distances. But um, so um, in in those um, in those projects, uh, manual redistribution is important too. And then. Um, they, once the agents are out there and established, they are a permanent part of the environment. You don't have to reapply them every year. You don't have to go out again and check that they are still doing their work and bring new ones every year or ten times a season, um, as in the case of um, herbicidal control. Um, they are permanent and they are sustainable. They don't wipe out the target weed population, but they remain in the environment. Um, people are always worried about the safety of biocontrol. Well, um, they are new organisms in an environment and of course we take great care to ensure that we only release host specific um, species. But if you work within those protocols that are internationally recognized as we do in South Africa, there are no um, sudden changes in the behavior of biocontrol agents we, as we thought they would not attack a, a particular non-target plant um, uh, for them to suddenly change that and start attacking something that we thought they would never attack. In other words, there have never been unanticipated host shifts in biocontrol. The few uh, non-target species that um, are affected in other countries, um, we don't have any like that in South Africa, but in USA there's um, cactoblastus and, and um, a few sizzle insects that affect other plants, but that was known from the beginning. It was only the perception of how important that was that has changed. Those are old projects from the 1950s, and now we worked according to much stricter protocols. So uh, biocontrol is really a safe science if practiced according to international protocols. In South Africa, the research for biocontrol, um, which um, consists mostly of finding insects and um, proving them host specific, is done by our organization, the Agricultural Resource Council, and specifically the Plant Protection Research Institute, where I work. We have um, satellite stations in Stellenbosch and Sadara and Pretoria. Um, uh, Rhodes University at Cape Town and WITS are also involved in a few projects. The financial support comes very graciously from Working for Water. Um, and they also supply us with biocontrol implementation officers who take the agents, once we have proved them safe and effective, they take them out and redistribute them. Unfortunately, this is not 100% effective. There are still some provinces without those people to redistribute the agents for us. Um, in South Africa, uh, 75 species of biocontrol agents have become established. Um, we have released a few more that did not become established, but 75 species are established. And amongst them, they are controlling 28 species of invasive alien plants. 
um, either under complete control, which means you need to do nothing more than have the buyer control agent there to keep them under satisfactory control, or um, the buyer control agents do the majority of the work and there are only a few more um, aspects that have to be covered by the landowner to, um, to supplement the buyer control agents. Examples of these plants that are under satisfactory buyer control, um, the five major floating aquatic reeds are under buyer control, all of them. Uh, uh, sorry, with the exception of water hyacinth, it could be under buyer control if the water hadn't been so polluted and if water affairs hadn't been so impatient to have the water bodies 100% clear without one single plant remaining behind and that of course precludes buyer control. Um, so water hyacinth is under um, buyer control for instance at, on Lake Victoria but not in South Africa. Um, there are many cactus species which are under effective buyer control. Those are some of our greatest successes. Um, you can see all the ones with the yellow borders are uh, cactuses with flat uh, so-called leaves or cladodes and then the cylindropantia cactuses, uh, cylindrical um, leaf, leaves or stem segments and then um, these ones, uh, queen of the night and uh, then there are many Australian um, acacia species or wattles as we call them which we don't have under complete biological control in so far that they are disappearing. We only have the seeds under effective biocontrol because we are not allowed to release anything more um, harmful because of the economic value of black wattle. Uh, we are not allowed to bring in biocontrol agents that can kill any of the wattle species. Therefore, we are. Um, limited to only seed feeding agents and fortunately there are some very effective ones so all of those are under effective or their seeds are being sterilized effectively. Um, some examples of our biocontrol agents that's a shot in um, Graaf Renet, Kijkiesberg near, uh, yeah, near Graaf Renet where the whole area was covered in prickly pear. Now prickly pear, the one that you eat is a cultivar that has been developed without spines but um, the, the wild plant is covered with spines so you get spiny prickly pear and spineless prickly pear the problem plant is the spiny prickly pear and that is what's growing in this area and after the introduction of cochineal and the cactus moth um, the area is now under complete control. The prickly pear has disappeared and you get the karoo vegetation there on which animals can graze. That is a, an example um, from the late 1920s. We also have other cactus species under effective biocontrol. This one is my project, chain fruit chola, or um, we used to call it rosea cactus, but that was a misidentification. It looks very much like rosea cactus, and we now know that we have rosea cactus in the country, but um, in the Eastern Cape. This one is in the Northern Cape and uh, near Douglas, as well as Musina. We um, found a biotype of a cochineal that was very damaging against it. That was not my research, it was uh, Catherine Gethuri, one of um, a, a Kenyan researcher who now resides in Australia, who did the research for that. And um, that's extremely effective. That photograph of just dead stumps remaining was taken near Musina, and the biocontrol agents have spread into Zimbabwe where the weed actually came from and where there is far more of it than we had near Musina and the, their plants are also collapsing. It's very difficult to find living cactus plants in, um, that, uh, in, in um, Zimbabwe. Unfortunately, in the Douglas area, this, the climate doesn't seem to be completely right for the cochineal and we are still battling a bit to get that under control. In your area, there's lots of queen of the night. We have a, an excellent mealy bug 
as well as a stem boring beetle and together they control the plants effectively, they really kill the plants. It's um, no longer true that um, the way we thought earlier that if the plant is already um, tall by the time it gets um, infected by the mealybug that um, it, it will not die um, soon enough and, and will continue to produce seeds that, which will reinfest your area. We found that that is um, not true. The mealybug goes immediately for flowers and developing fruit, so it's safe to even infest big plants and they will die before they produce more seeds to infest the um, area. Red water fern has a very effective bio control agent, a tiny weevil about two millimeters um, long, and it's one of the most <coughs> effective and fast working examples of bio control, because in nine months of release, it can get any water body clear of azolla and no matter where else azolla pops up the biocontrol agents find it before we find it there's still only a little rim of azolla around the uh, periphery of the water body and the in insects have already <coughs> discovered it and infested it so this is extremely effective Cisbania, um which um, blocks waterways and causes flooding has three biocontrol agents working together. Um, a seed, well, the, this one feeds on the ovaries in flower buds and prevents the plant from producing pods. If it's not quite well synchronized and pods are formed, there are, um, there's a second species of weevil that um, feeds on the developing seeds and completely kills all the seeds in any pod. And then there's a stem borer which kills the standing plants. So um, together, those three plants of the three insects are extremely effective. They sterilize the plant and they kill it. Afterwards, there's nothing more that needs to be done. Um, the stand looks like that, and the next step is that people come and collect firewood, and then it's gone back to natural vegetation. Um, unfortunately, there are not effective biocontrol agents for each and every invasive plant species, and some of them are not 100% effective. They can't <coughs> kill the plants. Therefore, a few other things always or often need to be done, and that is called um, integrated control. For instance, water hyacinth, as I said, that is water hyacinth on the Vol River. We already have a large suite of insects on it. We, uh, in South Africa, we have the largest number of biocontrol agents against water hyacinths um, anywhere in the world. But still, um, even though the latest one, uh, the latest one, Cornops, the grasshopper, so-called in red, um, is still being released, and we have uh, a lot of hope for it. But um, you can see how well the um, biocontrol agents manage to feed on the on the plants themselves and shortly after the stage they will sink but still the water is so dirty um, but dirty water is food for plants so it makes it, the water very suitable for plants um, water plants to develop in so biocontrol alone cannot control water hyacinth um, to, uh, Together with biocontrol, we need to do something mechanical like hauling the water hyacinth out of the water. Um, they are working for water teams who do that, and Boxburg or somewhere there's a, a mechanical harvester who does that day and night. You can also spray herbicides, but you must spray when the insects are in a um, stage when they can escape. In other words, not inside the plant where they will die if the plant gets killed, but you must do the timing very well and you mustn't spray the whole width of the river but leave a few uh, uh, plants on the edges but if the water quality the effluent is not improved then no control methods will help so we need a um, concerted effort against water hyacinth. Lantana is another one like that the the plant is just a very um, effective hybrid, it's not a species, but a hybrid um, between many different original plant species. And there are no natural enemies that are used to this plant because it's a man-made hybrid. 
It also um, grows in areas where the natural enemies can't grow because the plant is a hybrid, it has hybrid vigor. So despite the fact that we do have um, 16, 14, I think by now we have 16 species of biocontrol agents established, the uh, latest one being a mite, which is extremely effective. Um, so in the, the coastal areas where the mite causes these little galls, instead of flowers or flower heads that um, produce seeds, um, this only works in coastal areas and unfortunately in inland areas we still need to cut down the plant and um, apply the registered herbicides in the right way to get rid of the plants. We are still continuing with research to find biocontrol agents that are effective in, um, in the inland areas but it's very unlikely that we'll ever find um, such agents. Where there's a conflict of interest between people wanting to utilize a species and others wanting to get rid of it because it's invasive, such as black wattle, it has commercial value but it's extremely invasive, mainly in the Western Cape. Biocontrol is a very good way of solving the conflict. Uh, we only introduced seed feeding weevils against it and um, they take out the seeds of the plant but leave the wood, in other words the stem, um, unharmed so the commercial people can still utilize the wood and export it, get money into the country but at least we are making the plant less invasive. We've also developed a mycoherbicide which means a fungus whose spores are uh, mixed with a carrier and then it gets a long shelf life and you can mix it then with something like in this case um, sunflower oil <coughs> something very cheap to buy and apply it to the um, freshly cut surface of uh, wattle, black wattle trees and then it causes a disease inside the stem which prevents the plant from regrowing otherwise it would have regrown at a, a terrible rate so um, there are also a few new ones which have been released from the deep jail uh, or the deaf jail. Um, we, we have two government departments who have to give us permission to release and sometimes they take years and years and we call it the government jail for our biocontrol agents. But recently we were working for Water helped us to get this, um, the act right and we got permission to release several biocontrol agents against the Thonia. There are two um, zygogramma species that are leaf feeders and they defoliate plants like that. Against the coma or yellow bells we can release this one already um, a leaf feeding ladybird and we are waiting to get permission to release a leaf miner. Um, against balloon vine we have permission to release a seed feeding weevil. Against pom pom weed we have permission to release a thrips which um, causes galls. Sorry, doesn't want to go. Uh, it, it galls the tips of the stem so that it th does no longer uh, produce seeds, um, which still doesn't go all the way, killing the plant. But at least it helps a lot to make it less invasive. Recently, um, we got permission to release. Uh, flower bud feeder, which Joan says they have released here, isn't it? No, not yet. Not yet, but soon to be released here. Um, and seeds being the major reason why bugweed is so invasive, it's very useful in that we have a flower bud feeder that prevents um, food, uh, fruit production. Um, we, are, we recently released corn ops, um, host specific aquatic grasshopper against um, water hyacinth, but unfortunately wherever we release people destroy the release sites and then our research is of no use. We are also waiting to get permission to release uh, a leaf sucking bug. Um, if you're wondering how it works, uh, we look for biocontrol agents in the country of origin of the weed. We um, export them to South Africa where we keep them under quarantine conditions from where they cannot escape and do our research there in um, insect cages. Uh, it takes years of research. Once we know what the insect is about, well it, it doesn't have to be an insect, it can also be a fungus or pathogen. 
but I work with insects, so most, most of the time I'll talk about insects. The insects um, are then exposed to um, host specificity tests where we give them a choice of all the possible plant species they might like to feed on and once we have eliminated all non-target plants and seen that they are host specific, we write up a report and that report gets evaluated by a panel of um, specialists and then um, we hope that government will give us permission to release. We need permission from agriculture as well as environment affairs, although environment affairs doesn't have regulations at the moment, um, but they will soon have. But in the past we have waited for three or four years to get permission to release something that we knew was safe. Then we mass rear the biocontrol agents and release them and then hand them over to working for water um, implementation officers who do the um, mass rearing and redistribution. We then develop um, methods of applying them, for instance that um, black wattle fungus um, had to be, uh, we had to develop a, a, a suitable carrier and a technique for it and this one uh, for Hakia, Hakia grows in very um, inaccessible areas up in the mountains in Stellenbosch where you can't go and take your hacksaw and, uh, or, or um, your axe but um, they ma developed a fungus that kills it and um, coated birdshot with the spores and then put them into a shotgun took the shotgun up in a helicopter, flew over the area and shot the the fungus coated bird shots into the hackia infestation. Well, they were pretty sure there was not going to be anybody there because it's inaccessible. Um, haven't had heard about any casualties, but um, we're waiting to hear how effective this is. And uh, that, that, those are called mycoherbicides. In other words, they are applied like a chemical herbicide, but they consist of fungus. Then um, we figure out how to make the most of the biocontrol agents. In other words, what can the biocontrol agent do for us? And if there's anything left, um, how can we um, supplement that? For instance, in the coastal areas, Lantana can be controlled biologically, but in the inland areas, we still have to do mechanical and um, chemical control. We regularly, regularly monitor the efficacy of the agent. There's Danny um, doing a... Um, photosynthesis um, analysis of water hyacinth after the mite uh, that she was working on and um, the lower one is where I work in Douglas where we measure how many cactus plants have not died and the plants are sometimes only that big after, after biocontrol but you've got to find them and count them. So um, biocontrol is not necessarily an alternative method, um, we're not saying that um, chemical and mechanical control are wrong, but it's a method that can supplement them, that makes the other methods work better and that makes them cheaper. And wherever there is biocontrol available, we urge people to please make the full use of biocontrol. Thank you very much. I would just like to add, if you go to our website www.arc.agrip.za, you go to quick links and under quick links, um, it's not at the bottom anymore, invasive alien plants. That is where you will find information on which projects we have and who is the contact person for each one. Gilda, promise me if I come to the old site again in St. Robsburg, you let me know if you're there with a shotgun or anything. <laughs> I don't trust you. No, those people are in Stellenbosch. Oh, okay. Thank <laughs> you so much for coming. Oh. Thank you for the lecture. Oh. Thank you very much. <laughs>